piece of work here, which of course is a piece that we did as a result of uh, Manny Marble's bargain deal on Alpha Max, which of course won the Pulitzer Prize. And <clears throat> my association with uh, Malcolm, and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Malcolm, that um, back in the uh, early 60s, I was in the military and about to go crazy. <laughs> uh, because I'm doing all this reading, all this studying, and, and uh, no one to talk. And so I heard Malcolm, and it was like someone cutting into your heart mm. and then stitching it back up. Mm. Because he was speaking truth to not only us, but to power. And um, so I always credit him as the first person to give me my voice. You know, Al Hajj Ashabah. And then other persons are, and I need to mention them all the time when I speak to the public, which I think you need to know about them, Margaret and Charlie Burroughs. <laughs> Margaret Burroughs and Charlie Burroughs founded the first black museum in the country, the DuSant Museum in Chicago. And so I went there when I was stationed at Fort, Fort Sheridan in uh, Illinois, trying to grow a natural in the Army. And um, <laughs> 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 so, Margaret Burroughs was in the kitchen working on a linoleum cut. I didn't know what a million cut is, but she's one of the finest artists, visual artists we've ever produced. And uh, I walked in, she, and at first time I saw a black woman of natural, uh, such a and she, <laughs> she said, what you want, boy? Uh -huh. And I said, well, I just, I need to talk to somebody. I just, I kind of, you know, I, I got all these questions, and I saw that it was an Ebony Museum of Negro History, and I said, let me come here. She said, go upstairs and talk to my husband. Now, he's on the second floor. His name is Charlie Burroughs. I did not know at that time Charlie Burroughs had been raised in the USSR. He spoke Russian fluently. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went up there and we had this, this sitting at the table writing and reading. Had this girl glass of clear liquid uh, by him. And I said, your wife, I need to come up here and talk to you. He said, well, sit down. Sit down. Mm -hmm. You want something to drink? I said, we got water there. He said, no, this is vodka. <laughs> <laughs> You know my background, I don't, I don't drink nothing, I don't drink anything. But anyway, uh, that was the start of a beautiful relationship. So I volunteered at the Dusama Museum, which was in their home. It was in their home, okay, for about three or four years. And then I met through Margaret Brill, De uh, Dudley Randall, who founded Broadside Press, which was the first serious black publishing company devoted to publishing black poets. And Dudley Randall and Margaret Burroughs, so after Malcolm had been assassinated, uh, they came together to put out this book called For Malcolm. And it got all these poets and, and prose writers, and we, we put that together. And that was my first relationship with Dudley Randall, and he published my, uh, well, I published my first book myself, which was Think Black, back in 1966. Then he picked up the next book, Black Pride. And then he published Think Black, and then from there on, he published about 10 books, and we became family. Um, and then there was a man by the name of Hoyt W. Hoyt W. H. O. Y. T. He was a managing nigger, editor of Negro Digest Black World Magazine. If you really want to know what happened in the black arts movement, the, you know, the black empowerment movement between 65 and 75, read Negro Digest Black World Magazine. And I was involved in the name change uh, of Black World, uh, Negro Digest of Black World Magazine. And then there was Barbara and Science Club. Uh, premier educator in this country, Barbara Ann mm -hmm. She's the one that slapped me out of my sexism. She was, mm -hmm. she was talking some nonsense and she, <laughs> she called me out. <laughs> I said, this will never happen again. <laughs> <laughs> and so we became family again. And that's what, that's what happens when truth hits you. Mm -hmm. right, see, right. Because I, just like most men in this country, have been raised to be sexist. Mm -hmm. And, and backwards and everything else, you know, mm -hmm. patriarchal and all this mess. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, Barbara um, became um, a, a big sister to me. In fact, I got my worst, first honorary doctorate from uh, DePaul University because she was the dean of the School of Education mm -hmm. uh, at DePaul. And then, of course, uh, the person who was a cultural mother to me for over 33 years was woman of mm -hmm. And there's a big history that I'm not going to go into now other than I'd like to just make sure that you all know right. that I'm here as a result of standing on the shoulders of those persons. Right. Yes. Right? Yes. That I didn't, you know, just drop out of the sky and say, this is a brilliant thing. <laughs> no, <not> <laughs> well, and so we come here uh, this afternoon.
to and, and, and really celebrate our brother. Um, and for me, as I mentioned, he gave me my voice. I'm just going to say a few words and I'm going to introduce our, our panel. And um, like many of you all here, when Malcolm was assassinated, it hurt. I mean, it just hurt so badly. And I wrote about this in some other books that I just stopped for a minute. But, you know, we, we live in a short, you know, we're like a short memory people. Right? We don't have long memories. And as a result of that, we, we, we keep making mistakes over and over and over again. And quiet as a cap, even though uh, President Barack Obama did not live up to what many of us would want him to do the first four years, I think he's going to do it the second four years. He's already, you know, got tall as a result mm -hmm. of standing up for uh, Sister Rice at the, at the, mm -hmm. at the U.S. You know, don't go after her, come after me. Right, right. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, as we look around the country and we look at black communities around the country, we're still in trouble. Mm -hmm. We're in deep trouble. And part of our responsibility, most certainly my responsibility, is to not let us forget that. Number two, in terms of third world press, which is having difficult times now, but what publishers not having difficult times unless you have a whole string of money coming in? on a daily basis, and you have the uh, uh, mass media making sure you stay alive, but there's a big war now between Amazon and, 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 and regular book publishers. But the mission of Third World Press is to tell our story. Mm -hmm. It's not to lie, it's not to talk about a disappearing to anybody, it's just to tell our story. And any people who have control of their own cultural imperatives, they're about the healthy replication of themselves. Can I get an eye shield? Yeah. <laughs> I, said, I mean, a healthy replication of ourselves. It's not about against this person, against that person, but what did we do? You see, how did we get here? I mean, we didn't walk on water to get here. I mean, I, I, we didn't come first class American Airlines. How did we get here? So what's, what's the history there? We can't forget that history. And the other key point is this. The great majority of black people in this country, we are not going anywhere. This is our land. We built this land. Mm -hmm. Right, you right. See? And so, yeah, so, so you have a good uh, number of our people fighting for reparations. So whether it comes or not, we still got to keep going. All right? And so we're short memory people. So white supremacy is a system that dominates black life from cradle to grave. Therefore, black life is seldom formally taught in our institutions, and even less discussed informally. Malcolm X told our stories over and over again. And each telling gained substance and nuance as he grew up as he grew and studied and struggled and traveled himself, and as he dialogued with heads of states and others, debated with family, friends, and foes, all making a statement on an ever-expanding maturity. His storytelling, especially his analysis of white supremacy, enabled us to tell our stories without the customary editing by enemies and cowards. Yes. The moral and cultural imagination of Malcolm X transitioned into our own lives producing generations of cultural sons and daughters who do not tap dance to the latest feel-good tunes provided by government or corporate America. He arrived during a time of deep winter, and it is still cold, with snow falling during the summer months. Okay. And it's important that we understand that the culture of white supremacy is pernicious, you know, and it's all-encompassing, and most of us and not all of the institutional choices of the United States. I mean, it isn't grained in white supremacy, a white nationalism, all right? So including the black community, and in many cases, even the black church. The political, historical, commercial, legal, and educational institution that nurture, guide, inform, and, and employ, entertain, educate, and define black life and development in America represent the front lines of white supremacy thought, theory, and practice. And I always say, you're not gonna walk into your home and tell exactly where you are culture. What's on your wall? Are the images on your wall that they reflect the best of our culture? What's on your bookshelves? If you got a bookshelf, <laughs> what are you reading? Right. That defines you. You go to your CD collection. What are you listening to? What kind of music? Great black music or booty call music? Mm -hmm. Go to your CD collection. You know, I mean your DVD collection. What are you, what are you looking at? Especially the DVDs that are wrapped up in a brown paper bag. 
<laughs> then you go to the um, children's room. What's on their walls? Dark Vader, Mickey Mouse, and Donald Duck. You know, we'll be in trouble. You know what? <laughs> so we, we have difficulty. And, but it, it is our charge. It is our responsibility. And I get back to what I said earlier. Any people who want to control their own culture and parishes. Our problem is we are not controlling our own culture and parishes. That's why the Proxim Center is such a beautiful and wonderful place. Because it does represent the best of us. The best of us. I met Vinny Shabazz in 1971. We've been close friends of the Shabazz family. I met her on a plane between Chicago and New York. The Shabazz daughters have suffered in unbelievable ways, having lived through the tragic death of both parents. This is a story worthy of Toni Morrison, a Toni Morrison novel, but it's not fiction. Professor Marvel has accepted the culture of, quote, say or write anything and prove me wrong, end quote. With this total disregard for the political and cultural effects his words and accusations would have on anyone, especially the family. When I met Betty, uh, Dr. Shabazz, um, She was finishing up her PhD uh, doctorate, and she was going on with her life. She was on the faculty at Megan College. And I just went up there and sat down <coughs> with her and just started talking, all right? And I started a beautiful relationship that lasted until she passed. Um, and Betty Shabazz took care of her daughters. Her grandson was involved with her tragic death. And that he has had a tragic life himself. And this is the names, uh, uh, namesake of Malcolm. Been in and out of prison. Well, homes more than prison. But he's out now and he's trying to get his life together. And her memorial, uh, what I call the first families, uh, Mrs. Evers, Mrs. King, Ozzy Davis and Ruby D. and I, we were the people to speak at the memorial on the And so I pledge my life and what I can do to not only keep his name, their name, alive, but to keep all of what we have up front. We don't have to lie to anybody. We don't have to, you know, I mean, we can just stand up front. So it's important that we understand that essentially, as history was habit, uh, this collection is edited by four men who have been influenced and critically impacted by the life and work of Malcolm X. All the contributors also have felt and benefit, benefited in unknown ways from the presence of our beloved brother and carefully composed uh, their essay as a contribution to the wonderful legacy of Minister Malcolm. Uh, the royalties from this book will go to the Malcolm X and Dr. Ben Shabazz Foundation in New York City. And what we've done, whatever programs that they have been putting on, we just send the boxes of books. It's just, 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 uh. And so, I made my comment there, and I want to, you know, just bring on this this, this wonderful group of panelists who are contributors to uh, by any means necessary. Malcolm X will not be invented. And I guess I would say one thing. I do not have anything personally against Manny Marvel. I feel that he's a scholar, serious man, and just tragically died you know, what, a weekend before the book was, this book was published. And so we're not here, I'm not here ever to beat him up. And I don't leave that at hominem attacks. And so what we tried to do was stick close to what was in the book and to deal with what's in the book. And that's what we ask all the contributors to do. And we have contributors in the book who are very critical of Dr. Manny Marvel's work, and we have contributors who are in support of this work. So I try to have a balance of what. Clyde Ledbetter, right. a doctoral student of African American Studies at Temple University. He's also a graduate student assistant here at the South of the African American Collection, where he has contributed in Digital Humanities Initiative to make the William Steele papers wildly accessible. And of course, 
Okay. Uh, I uh, I usually join these programs. I sit right over there uh, behind that computer, uh, and it's really because of Dr. Diane Turner that I even heard about the uh, this book that uh, Mr. Boyd, Dr. Matabudi, and Dr. Karanga, and Dr. Daniel uh, were looking for contributors about the uh, variable text. And Dr. Turner, one day I was over there doing my work, and Dr. Turner said, you should submit some. You read the book, you probably have an opinion, submit some. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm just some, some punk graduate student. <laughs> what, what, what? Uh, the people writing this book will probably be you know, luminaries, which they are. And where, where do I stand in, in, in that? So I said, I'll, I'll write something and just, just you know, they'll probably say no, so I'll just do <laughs> Surprisingly, they, they accepted uh, uh, my essay, my opinion, and I'm, I'm grateful and honored uh, to be included in that collection and to be included on this panel with Dr. Fraser, uh, Dr. Jennings, and, and being moderated by Dr. Mark uh, My essay, Oh, before I start, and I would be remiss not to say this in front of such a large audience, um, Malcolm's life was about struggle. And like Dr. Mahabudi discussed it in his introduction, our struggle continues. And although maybe a minor struggle, it's still an important one. And right here at Temple University, a struggle is brewing between the university and the Department of African American Studies. And with such a large crowd, large crowd here, I'm, I'm imploring you, and you know, I think uh, if you go on the website of, uh, or not the website, but there's a petition going around. Long story short, uh, the university is trying to deny us proper leadership in our department. Leadership. And they are trying to push upon us uh, a new vision of African American studies that's not in line with what we want, it's not in line with what the community wants, and it's not in line with the mission of our discipline. Um, so, if we can get uh, some type of sign-up sheet going around with the email addresses, um, the phone numbers, where you can contact, because there is a, a uh, struggle that we'll need all your support on. Um, upcoming. This my little commercial. <laughs> Back to the essay. Uh, my essay was on uh, uh, more of the, the reaction to, to Mirable's uh, text, and it, it was entitled Malcolm, Charisma, and Ancestry. And what I basically argue is that there was such a heated reaction uh, from the African American community to Mirabel's text because it was viewed as an attack on a charismatic ancestor. And I go on the text to discuss, you know, what charisma means and what ancestry means to our community. Um, I begin with discussing implicit and explicit goals. You know, what was as scholars, when we sit down to write a book, an essay, uh, 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 an editorial, there has to be some goal behind it, some implicit goal. And Dr. Miller understands this, because in his text, when he talks about the autobiography, he talks about the implicit goals of both Malcolm X and Alex Haley. Yeah. At the beginning, uh, Malcolm's implicit goal was to use the autobiography to exalt Elijah Muhammad to show how the teachings of Elijah Muhammad can change someone from the life that they were living to the life that he had at the time. Uh, as, as he broke from the nation and moved on, the implicit goal changed to really expose his new political ideology, although that didn't make it into the uh, autobiography as a result of the implicit goals of Alex Haley, who, was, who wanted to use autobiography as a way to show what happens in America if we keep this segregated system, this, 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 you know, horrible system of oppression will create these people like Malcolm, these angry black men like Malcolm. So that was Alex Haley's implicit goal. But because he passed away, we don't know Dr. Miracle's implicit goal. He gives us a goal uh, in, in the book, uh, and his goal was to, uh, the purpose of the book, and this is right in the text, was to go beyond the legend to recount what actually occurred in Malcolm's life. To go beyond the legend and find out what actually occurred in Malcolm's life. Now, like I said, I'm just a punk graduate student. I don't know too much, but uh, I 
what I know about Malcolm X and the legends I've heard, you know, uh, I never heard of you know Malcolm going to the South with one machete and killing 300 Klansmen, or Malcolm went to Africa by himself and into Angola and attacked the Portuguese. <laughs> by, I, I, these aren't the, I never heard any legends. The only legend I heard was a young boy whose father was killed by the Klan, whose mother, due to mental health reasons, was unable to care for her children, who was separated from his family, raised in oppressive foster homes and foster care, who grew up as a teenager on the streets, uh, uh, got into criminal activity, um, went to jail, got religion, turned his life around, and changed the lives of millions of people all over the world and to this day. That's the legend I know. Mm -hmm. And so when Dr. Miracle says he wants to go beyond the legend, I, I, I don't know what's untrue about that story, what's, what's, what's exaggerated about that, and why we need to go beyond that. Um, in fact, he says uh, he, the only thing he, he, he cites uh, in here, he says, in Malcolm's case, the memoirs written by friends and relatives have illustrated that the notorious outlaw Detroit Red character Malcolm presented in his autobiography is highly exaggerated. The actual criminal record of Malcolm Little for the years 1941 through 46 supports the contention that he deliberately built up his criminal history, weaving elements of his past into allegory, documenting destructive consequences of racism within the U.S. criminal justice and penal system. Self-invention was an effective way for him to reach the most marginalized sectors of the black community, giving justification to their hopes. And then he, then that's it. So, the only thing that we can, uh, that Mirable can say that Malcolm lied about or exaggerated about was his criminal activity. Um, that he exaggerated it. But that's not just where Mirable starts. He goes on adding to, uh, or supposedly going beyond the legend by creating a legend of his own. A legend of, 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 of uh, uh, sexual uh, 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 escapades outside of his marriage a legend of, of, of homosexual uh, prostitution um, that he writes about. These are legends. Um, and that was what many people saw as the attack on this charismatic ancestor, this attack on Malcolm X. Why are you doing this, Mr. Mary? Why are you putting this, this legend that you're creating? And what I do in my, in, in my essay is, is try to understand our community's reaction to this, this attack on this charismatic ancestor. So I begin by looking at what is charisma? What is charisma? It's a, it's a term that's thrown around a lot, like revolution. Um, uh, a term that, you know, sneakers can be revolutionary and reality TV show stars can be charismatic. It's a term that a lot of people don't really understand completely. Um, even Mirable, because in, in, uh, in this text, he calls Tupac Shakur a charismatic figure. Now, if you understand what charisma is, you can understand that Tupac is not necessarily charismatic. He's likable, and charismatic <laughs> is not a, a substitute for likability. Charisma is, is, is a very uh, specific sociological definition and was really popularized and coined by the German sociologist Max Weber. Um, and Weber, uh, when he discusses uh, charisma, he discusses as one of his three types of authority. Baby talks about three types of authority. Traditional, rational, legalistic, and charismatic. Now, for Baby, traditional authority is like uh, your, your kings, queens, monarchs, popes, that type of thing. That, that these people hold these positions that go back to time immemorial, and that's, that's the base of their authority. Rational, legalistic is more modern. That's, you know, your parliamentarians, your presidents, your congress people, that sort of thing. Um, but charisma is a very specific type of authority and a very specific type of leadership. Uh, according to Weber, charismatic authority rests on the devotion of the polity to the specific and exceptional sanctity, heroism, or exp exploratory character of an individual person, and that of the normative patterns or order revealed or ordained by him. Charismatic authority is said to exist when an individual claim to specific gifts of body and mind is acknowledged by others as a valid basis for their participation in an extraordinary program of action. That's important, an extraordinary program of action. The charismatic leader leads his followers outside the realm of everyday routine. He or she repudiates the past and is in a sense a specifically revolutionary force. 
the followers obtain freedom from the commonplace, the ordinary, the recurrent, by surrendering to both the initiatives of the leader and the emotional centers of his own being. Um, and the thing about charisma, Malcolm's charisma was a very simple type of charisma, what Weber called pure charisma. And pure charisma is something that can't be taught, learned, or inherited. It becomes naturally, and more specifically in the eyes of followers from supernatural forces uh, given to the leader. Um, Malcolm's pure charisma was displayed early in his life when he was elected class president and, and given some measure of authority in the predominantly white school in rural Michigan in the 1930s. You have to be charismatic if you want to be uh, uh, that type of position for white people in the 30s. Uh, you know, the same pure charisma will lead him in his underground life. Uh, uh, where people will follow him and do exceptionally bad things. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Uh, and it was the same uh, pure charismatic uh, leadership that would blossom over the years and allow Malcolm to build off the work of the semi-charismatic Elijah Muhammad. Uh, Elijah Muhammad uh, was more of a traditional leader in the variant sense. He inherited his position from probably a, a, a truly charismatic person in, in, in uh, uh, WD for art, who came from somewhere else to convince a lot of black people that he was Allah, that takes charisma to do. So when he disappears and Elijah Muhammad, you know, takes uh, uh, control of the nation, it's more of a traditional sense of authority. But Malcolm's authority rests in his pure charisma. So he was able to take an organization of a few hundred people and turn it into an organization with a number in the tens of thousands and affect the lives of millions. Malcolm's leadership as a minister and top recruiter for the nation of Islam would truly lead his followers outside the realm of the everyday routine. And that's what a charismatic leader has to do. It's not just being a leader, not just being a leader, but taking the, uh, the, the group and the members of that group and taking them out of their everyday routine and leading them on a program of extraordinary action. So you had to do that. You had to be charismatic to build uh, an organization like this because the nation, the strictness of the nation's regulation for its members and the complete life changes that occur for those who converted to his program could only be made attractive to those outside the organization through the medium of charismatic figure, which Malcolm was. More on uh, pure charisma, Anton Allah writes, it is particularly disdainful of economic pursuits or economic gain and prefers to be supported by voluntary gifts and communal logistics. Uh, and throughout Mar Malcolm's time in the nation, he didn't seek any financial gain. You know, he lived an extremely modest life, even with a wife and four children, he didn't even own his own home. Uh, so it was this pure charisma that differentiated Malcolm's authority, ultimately from that of Elijah Muhammad, whose charisma was more traditional, like I said. Uh, Malcolm's pure, in relation to Elijah Muhammad, greater charisma would ultimately lead to his break with the nation. His charismatic authority was so strong that even without a well-defined program, he was followed out of the nation by large numbers of faithful who had hitherto structured their lives on teaching Elijah Muhammad. It was this pure charisma that made Malcolm split from the nation so dangerous for so many different groups. For those in leadership positions inside the nation, Malcolm's charismatic authority would in all likelihood continue to lead people both away from and out of the organization. For reactionaries in American politics, Malcolm's charismatic authority would influence a much larger audience and be coupled with an ever-shaping revolutionary pan-African political and economic ideology. So, understanding charisma and understanding Malcolm as a pure charismatic authority figure in a Bavarian sense, what does that mean for our people? And how do we uh, gel that with this idea throughout the African world of ancestry? And to understand that, we have to understand a little bit about, about ancestry. And the question becomes, does Malcolm's charismatic authority stop at the end of his physical life? No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, in, 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 in a memoir written by Malcolm Jarvis, who was Malcolm's uh, uh, teenage friend, Shorty, the uh, guy Shorty, uh, he writes, he, he quotes Roy, Roy Wilkins, uh, who, who said of Malcolm, that he was a master spellbinder. Even in death, he cast a spell far and wide and more disturbing than he cast in life. Now, I don't think Roy Wilkins was in any way an open advocate uh, of traditional African spiritual beliefs, um, but his statement rings true nonetheless. Um, because if we understand ancestors and that the dead members of our community watch what we say and watch what we do and affect what happens on this earth, and these are the ancestors who are invoked constantly, and if you've been to any uh, 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 program recently, nationalist program, and have a report libations. 
I guarantee Malcolm's either the second or third person mentioned. <laughs> we invoke his name every time, everywhere. And we're not doing it just, 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 to, just to do it. We expect that his presence will be with us. His presence will motivate us. His presence will lead us. So uh, when we understand that, and we understand uh, uh, when Malcolm speaks to those who invoke his presence, they listen and respond. When Malcolm's voice tells us to, that history is best suited for our study, we go study history. When Malcolm tells us to protect our women with our lives, we do it. And when Malcolm tells us to fight for our human rights and for self-determination by any means necessary, we have no choice but to act. Thus, the anger and confusion felt by many uh, in our community after Dr. Miracle's book uh, was, seen both as attack, it was not seen as an attack on a dead, lifeless icon, but one on a living, charismatic, ancestral presence. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, charisma can only be maintained as long as the followers of leader believe it to be believe him to be extraordinary. So all this talk about this this text though, or this this process of humanizing Malcolm, what, that's that's what do, what do we mean by that? What is the humanizing? Because most of us don't follow leaders that are like us. <laughs> Just putting that out there. Uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, I just wanted to say, that, uh, fortunately. The power of Malcolm's ancestral charisma, the, the charisma that brought all of us in here today. I, like I said, I work right over there, and we have programs. I've never seen so many calls come in. When's the program? When's the Malcolm program? Is it three o'clock? Is it two o'clock? Is it Thursday? His 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 leadership and authority is still with us. He's still in this room. Al Hodge and Lee Gosh are not there. What is not uh, often elaborated upon is that when Malcolm left the Nation of Islam. He knew he was going to die. That he knew he had trained many of the nations of Islam uh, ever right. And he knew that many of these brothers had come out of prison. And that they were ready for danger. And that internally what had happened, I'm not going to go too deeply into that, but he knew that he his time was limited. And so therefore lived in a state of, of fear. At one level. But just like I think that any man or woman who's serious about our struggle, you run toward there. You don't run away from it. And use his last uh, days on this earth to better himself and, to, and, and by extension to better us. And this is why you know we're here. One thing I did not mention about this, this, this wonderful collection is that it was brought into fruition with the generous support of the uh, Womax Company that filled out. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that Dr. Alessio Asante is in the book. And as you know, uh, he has created the Alessio Asante Institute mm -hmm. here in Philadelphia mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Womax and I and others have had uh, time to go there and spend some Meaningful uh, hours. Also uh, in the book uh, are Amir Abdul Kibal, Abdul Kilaman. And Abdul, Dr. Abdul Kilaman is, is, is the brother of the left. And we've had many battles. <laughs> but uh, he's in, and this essay is a fine essay. Uh, there's a, um, a brother by the name of Rick Ayers. You may not know the name, but Rick Ayers is the brother of Bill Ayers. And, and that's the infamous Bill Ayers. Okay. That's so cool being influenced by President. Uh, Talanisi Coates, uh, who is, uh, he writes for the Atlantic. He is the son of Paul Coates. Paul Coates founded the Black Classic Press, and he also was a member of the Panther Party. Yes. All right. I just want to mention a couple of people um, that's in the book. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Michael Simonga, you may not know that name, but Michael Simonga now heads the African American Arts uh, program for the city of Atlanta. You know, every two years he used to be doing this African, African American uh, program down there. He's in our own uh, Dying D. Turner. <laughs> Behind. Behind. Right. So she, the two of them wrote a wonderful uh, essay 
stamps are also here. Uh, finally, I want to say, brothers and sisters, that uh, we just go to questions at this point. Oh, yeah, I mentioned that uh, Dr. Earl Henderson. You may not know Dr. Earl Henderson, but he is a, a, a brother who has done very serious work. He's on the faculty at uh, Penn, um, and he contributed very fine financially, and there, and there are others. Tell Bronson, because Bronson, Brox, I guess that's, uh, that's uh, uh, Paul Robeson, stand behind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paul Robeson influenced me also. Um, I write about this in Yellow Black. I was on my way to basic training uh, at um, Fort Littlewood, Missouri in 1960. Uh, six foot one, 131 pounds, like a walking skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> and going to the Army because it's the poor boys and the unemployment. It is now the poor boys and poor girls answer to unemployment, which is the real 1% that's fighting these wars. Okay? That's the real 1% that nobody cares about. Mm -hmm. But I was reading Here I Stand by Paul Robeson, and when I stepped off the bus, the white drill sergeant, about 34, 35 years old, saw Paul Robeson's face on the book and snatched it out of my hand and barked at my face, what's your Negro mind doing reading that black comic? <laughs> well, you know, that's the first time I heard a double negative, you so creative. <laughs> um, he said, all you women up against the bus. Now, this is 1960s. Women had not come into the military at any serious level. So it was all three black men and the rest white men. Right? And he held my book over his head, and he commenced to tell the pages out the book and give a page to each of the recruits they used us for toilet paper. Now, I don't know what to do. I mean, I can't go AWOL. I'm not, you know, I don't have a place to go anyway. Because the only reason I'm in the Army is because I don't have family, I don't have anything, I'm by myself. Right? <coughs> so I decided three things that day. Uh, one was that ideas are important. That the ideas and the creators of ideas and the carriers of ideas run the world. We all tap dance to somebody's ideas. Mm -hmm. If you're Christian, that's an idea. If you're Muslim, if you're Sikh, if you're Hindu, those are ideas. And Democrat, Republican, Socialist, Communist, again, ideas. In fact, if you remember the Sugar Hill game, <laughs> ideas are powerful. And that's why this institution exists. And that's why the African American Studies Department should exist. You see? Again, I get back to where I started with. Any people who control their own cultural imperatives fight for those imperatives. And it's your job now. Okay? Uh, Dr. Lomax, Lomax, I, Jennings. It's your job. You know, and we, we continue to do our work, but it's really your job. And I would suggest, as Dr. Jennings pointed out, that you contact the alumni and that you bring them back here in mass. Mm -hmm. So today, boom, let's get back up here and let's turn this thing around. Mm -hmm. All right? It is an insult for somebody who's not even in the field to come in and essentially direct the program. Yes. Direct the it's an insult. It's not an insult to you and to us, but to the founders. He's still here. And I guess I'm not even allowed in the program. I don't know the history. The point is that it is an insult. And if anything, we stand on these shoulders and we're not, you know, we're not laying down for anybody. We're definitely not going to bend over. So it is on us.